Okay. We go to Romans chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Easter is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? <clears throat> but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, we, we return to verse 1. This is the writing of a man who was, uh, who was seriously persecuted by the Jews. You remember in verse 9, in chapter 9 rather, he said, I wish, I wish I would be accursed so that Israel can be saved. This is the uh, expression of genuine love. Paul had great love for the Jews in spite of all his experiences with them. You know, that uh, statement that he would rather be accursed for their sake is very powerful indeed. It's an expression of love. The same thing that, the same sort of thing that Moses said, if you will not forgive them, blot me out of your book. Now, when we pray for people to be saved, we identify what their problem is. Yes, Paul identified what the problem is. He said, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. Okay. But not according to knowledge. Okay, this is what the problem is. They have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. And, and what is, that is a common problem. That is a common problem that uh, you and I uh, face today in Christianity. A lot of zeal, a lot of passion, but no knowledge. Okay. What is the problem here, really? The problem is that, as he will state later, they have not understood the righteousness that comes through faith. Okay? But let us stop a little on this zeal without knowledge. Many examples of zeal without knowledge abound in the church today. I'll give you a simple example. Take love, for example. Many have love. They seek to have love, but without knowledge. Because 
What they don't realize is that to love is to be patient and kind. To love is not to be jealous or boastful or proud. To love is not to be rude. To love is not to demand always that to have your own way. To love is not to be irritable. To love is not to keep a record of wrongs. To love is not to rejoice in injustice because the man is your enemy or something. But to love is to rejoice always when truth prevails. To love is never to give up. Never to give up. To love is always to have faith that things will turn around. To love is to hope all things, endure all things, and believe all things. To love is never to give up. Love never fails. Love never fails. So, it is so easy to have zeal without knowledge. You know, so, so easy. Like when people bring offering without righteousness. It's so easy. You know, it's so easy to, 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 to do so many things that, that is not underscored by the principles of godliness. Love is to cover all sins. So you don't expose people you love to, to ridicule and, and, and shame. You know, you don't expose them. No. Love covers all sins, according to Proverbs 10, 12. This is, this is the knowledge that must underscore, you know, under God, what we express and do and what we profess. You know, so there are so much, there is so much zeal without knowledge in our time. So it's not only the Jews that are zeal without knowledge. They profess to love God deeply, but they reject the righteousness that comes through faith. They want to, to establish their own righteousness through the law. Now, verse 3 says, For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. This is the, 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 the lack of knowledge that is uh, uh, exhibited in this. Because um, what, what they have not uh, accepted is that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. In other words, that righteousness that you are trying to achieve through a strict observance of the law, which you cannot achieve anyway. You can achieve it in Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Now, now it is the simplicity of it and, and, and we, we need to have knowledge of it because of the, uh, uh, the, the scriptures say it is by grace. You know, many people don't get it. You know, grace is what provides it. Faith is what receives it. Okay? Grace is actually the source of salvation. And that grace is unmerited favor. You know, things that nobody can deserve to be made right with God. You know, nobody can deserve it. So, so, but faith is to say, I, I, I believe it and I, and I receive it for myself. That's why salvation is by grace through faith. You have to accept the grace. Now, it's either you accept the grace or you continue on the way of the law, which, is, which makes righteousness unattainable because nobody keeps the law in any consistent way. You may keep the law some of the time, but to keep the law all the time. And James 2.10 says, if you're offending one, you're offending all. Now, they, they bring two prisoners. They say, this man is a thief. You know, they say, this man is a thief. It's okay. 
what, does, what did this man say? Two eggs, he stole two eggs. This man is a thief, he stole two eggs. This man is a thief, he stole a million dollars. Yeah, big thief, small thief, thief, all the same. This is what James is saying. You're offending one, you're offending all. So, 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 the, 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 to have zeal, you must, you also have to have knowledge so that you know exactly what, what this whole thing is all about. Christ is the end of the law because in Psalm 40, you know, he made the point, um, David made the point that uh, God does not desire sacrifice and offerings. You know, David knew that. You see, he said the same thing in Psalm 51, verse 16. He said, if you desired sacrifice and offering for this sin, I'm going to, I would have given it. But that's not what you desire. What you desire is a penitent heart. It's a penitent heart. And we see this consistently manifested in the relationship the Jews had with both John the Baptist and um, Jesus Christ. Now, why did the Jews reject John the Baptist? Why did they reject John the Baptist? Why did they persist in following their own way? For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's will. They cling to their own way. Now, why did they do that? There are obvious reasons. Number one is that if they had accepted John's baptism for repentance, the Pharisees, they would have admitted that they are the same as the tax collectors and, 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 and sinners, you know, who went happily to John's baptism. Those ones acknowledged they were sinners. But uh, these ones that acknowledge that, 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 uh, that believe that they are righteous, they, don't, they feel they don't need John's baptism unto repentance. You see, and that's what our Lord Jesus Christ said to them in Luke chapter 7, you know, verse 27. John is the man to whom the scriptures refer to when they say, Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. When they heard this, all the people, even the tax collectors, agreed that God's way was right, for they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees are experts, okay? The Pharisees are experts in religious law, rejected God's plan for them, for they had refused John's baptism. Okay, so to submit to John's baptism is to admit that you are like a sinner. And so the Bible, Paul says, no, not having the knowledge of God's righteousness, they devised, they kept insisting on their own. And that's why they could not attain to the righteousness that is of faith, which, which actually assures a man that is accepted by God because he's coming through faith. And of course, you know that all through the book of Romans, all he's trying to establish is that justification has always been by faith long before the law came by stating that the scriptures said that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And so when you and I believe God, what he says, what he teaches, what he reveals, then it will also be accounted to us for righteousness. Not only uh, 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 in the matter of our soul salvation, but also in the matter of godliness. So if a man repents of his sin, if a man puts on the righteousness of Christ, he too must believe that he is unblameable, he's unreprovable, and he's holy before God. He may not be holy before men, but he's holy before God. Because that's what the scriptures say. He has put on the righteousness of God. But if he doesn't walk in that righteousness in his life, of course, he will be, he will be a candidate for chastisement. You know, which you and I know. So it's important to, to have zeal that is according to knowledge in everything that we do. It's not just enough to be bubbly and excited about God. But it's also good to have the knowledge of his will so that we can walk in righteousness 
and walk in holiness before him. We're going to continue in this meditation because uh, it takes us into the um, practical dimensions of our faith in Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs>